This is Whiskey Whereabouts, I'm Tim. And if you're like me and you subscribe to First Fill Whiskey's fantastic YouTube channel, great videos. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you may have noticed that he finished up a video by nominating a few other whiskey YouTubers, including me, to take up a challenge that he himself had already met in that video, which is to choose just one whiskey for each of the six Scotch whiskey regions. So here I am. What am I gonna choose from the lowlands? How am I gonna choose from Isla? Let's get into it. My whiskey journey has taken me to Scotland and back. I've explored whiskey education, tastings, and distilleries from Isla to Speyside. And now my journey continues here with you on Whiskey Whereabouts. So this challenge actually originated with Jeff Whiskey. And if you're not subscribed to his channel, you definitely should be. I'll put a link to his original video and a Phil's video in the description so you can kind of check them out if you haven't seen them. But basically Jeff had taken up the discussion about the whiskey regions, right? So we have these five officially recognized Scotch whiskey regions. There are plenty of examples of whiskeys from each of the regions that sort of embody the qualities that we attribute identifiers for each of the regions. There's just so many exceptions now, right? There's so many distillers in each region that aren't simply replicating the same thing, which is great, right? This is a great thing for us. More distilleries, more variety, more choices. I basically tried to imagine setting up a flight, one from each region, that sort of embodies expected qualities of each of the regions, since these are sort of ambassadors for the regions, bottles that are available, not at the just corner store. You had to go to a, a decent quality shop to get these bottles. And if you were paying attention at the beginning, I mentioned six whiskey regions. There are five officially recognized regions, right? Lowland, Highland, Speyside, Isla, Campbelltown. But the Highland region is sort of the catch-all. It's, it's where we put all of the distilleries that don't fit in any of the other four regions. And there's been this sort of informal movement saying, look, let's have a sixth region and that region is gonna be all the other islands, the islands that aren't Isla, but now we've got a distinction and it's gonna narrow down what's left in the highlands. And so Jeff went with the six, so that's uh, what I'm going to do. And the qualities that we expect from the highlands are sweeter, floral, nutty, heather, fruity. I went with sort of Whiskey YouTube's kind of favorite approachable whiskey, the Deanston 12 year, right? Bourbon matured whiskey, so we don't have a lot of exotic influence here, but you are going to see some of these overlap. There's some of that floral on the nose and the palate and some of that uh, maltiness, some of the fruitiness we're going to see in this whiskey. Next, we're gonna go to Lowlands where we expect lighter whiskeys traditionally, right? Grassy, floral, ginger, maybe toffee sweet. Um, there's triple distillation going on down there. It's only two distilleries that do that now. And I ended up going with a distillery that's a very sort of long established lowland distillery that has a lot of uh, whiskey that a lot of people are excited about right now. And it's Bladnock. A lot of people have selected Bladnock and I think it's because it fits this profile and I went with the accessible Bladnock. The 11 year is just not sort of readily available, uh, not around me. I went with the sort of entry level, non-age statement, the Venaya. Cereal, sort of honey notes, the grassy notes, the floral. It isn't just super, so they're light, traditional. It has some more dimension to it. It has more to offer. And I think that's a good ambassador of where we are with the lowlands right now. We've got a lot of activity there, a lot of growth. The lowlands are not just Akintoshan and Glenkitchi anymore. Next, we're gonna go to the informal region of the island. Often peated, sort of briny, sort of salty. And it's hard to sort of discount Talisker here, right? We think of, you know, Talisker from up on sky as, as being a, a very sort of traditional kind of idea of separating out something from the islands, uh, to me, from the mainland highlands. But to me, nobody is sort of working on the same level Tobermory is working on with the Lechaik uh, core range on the islands uh, right now. The 18 year is absolutely fantastic. As reflected in the results of my blind tasting tournament back in March, the Malt Madness tournament, it's not on every shelf. 
it's tough to get here in the US. Um, the Sinclair is, is tremendous, uh, not an H statement. Lechake, but let's not overthink it here, right? The Lechake 10 year. This, this is sort of a worthy ambassador of what we're talking about here with this unofficial region. Briny, sort of salty qualities. It's going to have an ashiness uh, with the peat. It's going to have a saltiness with the sweetness, maybe almost a caramel, a really worthy ambassador, a very well presented, nice age statement whiskey for the money. So we're off to Speyside now, the region home to the most distilleries and one that we have covered in uh, pretty good detail on the channel recently. If you haven't checked out my ranking of the top 24 distilleries from Speyside, um, I'll put a link uh, to one of those videos. Uh, you can check it out up here. And it usually kind of goes in one of two ways. And it's those sort of traditional um, starting sort of entry level whiskeys that are so, so common, so popular. The Glen Livid, Glen Fittick 12 years, Orchard Fruits, Vanilla, Honey, some Spice. And then we've got the sort of sherry influence. Very common sherry maturation in Speyside. So which way to go with the uh, representative from Speyside? I'm sort of of two minds about what Speyside sort of is. And I'm kind of leaning um, toward the whiskeys that are a little bit higher quality, the ones that kind of are still sort of intriguing to us. Um, and they often have that big sherry influence. So, you know, you could go the way of the sort of big sherry bomb, the Abelauer Abenad, so the Glen Farkless 105. Um, you could go with a distillery that did very well in my rankings, we'll say that. Um, Glen Alecky. This is the 10 year, the cask strength offering. Um, this was Phil's uh, choice. So you really feel like you can't kind of go with that, but I have actual reasons not to choose this one as much as I like this bottling. It's batch by batch. So sometimes it's easier to get than others. And there is a variation with the batch. I think of that Glenalkey 15 year, but I'm thinking I'm getting a little bit heavier sort of dose of the sherry when I'm getting into those sort of PX and Oloroso casts. So maybe I want to go with just Oloroso. This is the line of thinking that brought me to choose Tamdu 15 year. All of the Tamdu offerings are Oloroso mature, but the Oloroso season casks are European and American oak. And in the American oak, we're gonna to expect to get some of that vanilla. We're gonna get a little bit of the sort of lighter side of Speyside mixed in. The way that manifests in Tamdu, I think, is in sweetness, not lightness. I think Tamdu is very rich. Okay, so now things are getting interesting. Let's go to Isla. And to me, Isla is such a special, sort of magical place. It's a self-contained whiskey island. What do we expect from these whiskeys? You know what we expect. Smoke, brine, some maybe medicinal, some oiliness, very distinctive peated influence here. This was really, really hard. And in fact, I kind of went and poured myself a dram each uh, sort of night uh, last week, thinking about my choice. One of the choices was the obvious Porto tenure, right? But can I choose a bottle from a distillery that does not use Isla Pete to be the representative. And we may be getting to a point in the not so distant future where there are more and more distilleries like this on Isla. I just couldn't go with anything over this bottle. And I know some people have already sort of done their videos and this one has come up before. There is a reason. This is a very, very special bottle. This is the Ardbeg Cory Frecken. 57.1% and it's not believed to have the sherry influence that the Ugadal has. The smoke, the oiliness, the campfire, the saltiness, ashiness, the tar. There's all these other complementary flavors mixed in. It's big. If I'm gonna go with a big cast drink whiskey, I feel like Isla is the place. Now we come to the region with the fewest number of distilleries, Campbelltown. They only have three and that is partly the result of uh, in the 90s with only two distilleries, there was some talk of no longer recognizing Campbelltown as its own region and uh, the ownership of Springbank. Uh, distilleries sort of pointed to the Lowlands, which at the time only had three distilleries in 1998. 
there's 17 of them now. That's how fast, how much growth we've had in the lowlands. But at the time they said the lowlands is a region and they only have three. What if we have a third and they reopened the Glengyle Distillery? Is there none? sort of peated offerings, but so we're talking about general character, a lightly sort of peated whiskey, some fruitier elements. There is this talk, this this term we use, the Campbelltown funk that we describe that certain something, the quality that sort of whiskey from Campbelltown, we expect it to exhibit, right? And here we have Springbank, one of the most popular distilleries that you can barely get your hands on any of the whiskey and it's really hard to argue against Springbank 10 being sort of the representative here. It's a very special bottle, but there is this thing that you may be familiar with about Springbank mania, where you cannot find this bottle, you can't find Springbank. If you can, you're being asked to pay huge sort of markup prices. And that sort of knocks out one of my criteria, right? It turns the accessibility of the thing. And so I'm going to put aside Spring Bank 10. I feel like a lot of us who have done this have tried to find a reason not to pick Spring Bank 10 here. And this is part of my criteria. So that's how I'm getting around uh, sort of going with that. And instead, I'm going to go with this bottle. It's the Kill Karen 12 here. Okay. And so here we have a bottle that isn't that much more accessible, but I, I feel like you can find this one for its retail price a lot easier than you can find Springbank 10 year, getting very, very well presented whiskey from the same parent company, different distillery, and it has a higher ratio of bourbon to sherry casks than the Springbank 10. This is 70 30, Springbank 10 is 60 40. I'm gonna expect some orchard fruit, some tropical fruit from this. I'm gonna expect that subtle peat, some, maybe some oiliness. But as I said before, there's so many exceptions that I probably could do an entire flight of whiskeys that don't embody those sort of qualities from each of the regions that I could put on the table blind in front of somebody after they experience those first six. And then I could pour a blind flight, not tell them what was in it, and ask them to sort them into the same regions as the ones that they just had, and no one would possibly ever get it right, because this would be a list that I'm gonna go quickly through um, of just examples of specific bottles that are that fit all the criteria, that are high quality, that you can find, that sort of go against the expected sort of qualities of each of the regions, right? And so let's start real quick in the highlands. I'm gonna go Glendronic. 15 year because it's so space id right very quickly moving on to the lowlands um this is a bottle that's come up on a lot of the sort of uh responses to the challenge um a really good example of what we're talking about right glasgow 1770 the peated it's got that peat influence we don't expect from the lowland whiskey right but it also has that sort of sherry influence sherry fruit next up in the islands i'm going to go with the aaron uh the sherry cask this is uh, a near cast strength it's 55.8 percent non-age statement aaron that is basically a sherry bomb that could be bought for about $80 that is just has space side cherry bomb written all over it. Going over to Isla, it's Boonahaven 12, obviously. This would really throw somebody for a loop, I think, uh, because it's not classically space side -y. It has a sort of sherry influence, but it has a sort of um, saltiness. It has something that, that maybe you might want to say that it's an island whiskey. If you really know this whiskey, you might be able to choose it. But, but, but blind, if you were asked to put this, you probably wouldn't stick it straight in the category of Isla, and you'd be trying to figure out what region it might slide into. On a space side, here's one I'd pour in my sort of blind flight. They would throw uh, a lot of folks off. Ben Romack 15. This is a whiskey kind of throws people off because it's not well presented. 43%, right? Um, it's presents it so much more than that. And we've got a bourbon and sherry influence here. Barbecue smoke, some of the sort of dried fruit, the sherry kind of chocolate and citrus and saltiness. I think if I were served this in a big blind flight without any information, maybe islands, we might want to put it over there. The final region is Campbelltown. And there's so few distilleries that I honestly, I don't know. I, I maybe you know, Glen Scotia. I can do that 18 year or something that I just reviewed on the channel is, a, is slightly atypical. There really isn't some some sort of really off the beaten path whiskey here uh, currently at this time, given the the, the the really low sort of number. So 
I'll source this one to you. If you if you if you've got a, a selection of one that's gonna throw somebody off here and, and they're not gonna be able to pick out of the blind flight, let me know. So in the end, it wasn't very hard for me to come up with high quality, sort of within reach bottles that epitomize the character, uh, at least as I appreciate, of the different sort of regions that we're talking about. Um, and it was just as easy to come up with bottles that uh, go against that sort of traditional character. And to me, it's kind of like learning a new language, right? You, you have to learn the sort of rules of grammar and everything to get started and then to become fluent you need to learn all the exceptions and learning those exceptions and and looking knowing what to look out for what to seek out um, comparing those uh, just makes the whole sort of process of going on this journey and going in depth on these uh, sort of different offerings from the regions it gives us a structure that makes it fun and makes it rewarding I found doing this video very rewarding, and so I was nominated. I will pass it along. Uh, there's been a lot of folks on Whiskey YouTube received this challenge or have already spoken uh, to it in videos. A couple people I'd like to hear from that I haven't uh, seen uh, address this yet. Uh, Shane at Whiskey Lock, his great channel. Love to hear what he has to say about this topic. Um, Toby from Whiskey Shared, like to hear him weigh in on this. So those are my sort of nominations. Um, if you enjoyed uh, this video, make sure you subscribe and hit this big button that's gonna pop up right over here. You don't wanna miss any of the future videos that are coming. I'll see you on the next one.